Karen. Yes, ma'am. I hope you're okay. I am. Thank you. Thank you for starting the Zoom. You're very welcome. Hi, everyone. Hey, Sam. Hi, Sandra. <laughs> Seems like I've been going away for years and years and years. <laughs> been doing election stuff. I know it. I know it. And it all turned out well. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Amen. Yes, it did. What time did you get finished last night? Uh, relatively early. I was back home about um quarter to nine. Oh, that's good. It is good. We've we had um fourteen hundred fourteen twenty five voters come through our precinct. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Good. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad it's over with. I'm glad we back on top again. Yes. Yes. Oh, hello, everyone. Hi. What is going on here? Why are you showing? I don't want you to see. <laughs> Talk to yourself, Sandra. I know my emails come popping up. <laughs> oh. Dr. Epps said that she may be five minutes late. Okay. Uh huh. But she is coming. Excellent. Thank you for arranging. Mm hmm. How's your finger? Um, I am better today than yesterday, but not as good as tomorrow. So. Okay. Okay. PT on Friday, so I know a little bit more then. Yeah. God, please, Karen. How's your mom, Karen? She's doing well. We're going to. A holiday open house this afternoon. So um, she likes this time of year. So, have you been in much pain with that? Oh, Sandra. Mm. Um, yeah, beyond words. Uh huh. But it's, I can tell as I heal, it's less and less pain. Okay. I don't ever want to do this again. I know you don't. Not on my radar. <laughs> wow. What you call a, a freak accident. Yeah. And, you know, if I didn't love these dogs so much, because I was going to a um, teacher's meeting in Athens, and I looked at them, I said, do you want to go out? And they're like, wag, wag, wag. And, um, you know, if I hadn't done that, the rest will be history. So, wow. Mm -hmm. I've checked on Doris. She's having a lot of pain. Mm. What's going on with Doris? <laughs> she had rotator cuff surgery. She fell in a warehouse shopping club. Mm. And, um, she um she um was um uh hurt and she tore broke or tore her rotator cuff when she fell. Mm. That's a couple of months recovery. I haven't had it, but I yeah, I've had it done. Mm-hmm. That's the ordinary thing about all of this is the older I get, the longer the recovery time. Yes. Uh. Duh, yeah. <laughs> Big job. Karen, I hate to ask, can you, I only caught in on the entail. What happened to you? I'm sorry. I'm, oh, okay. So, and ironically, 
my church had a float in our local Christmas parade, and it was the Starship Enterprise. And so what? I could do the live long <laughs> So much for your drumming for a little while. Well, I'm I'm able to drum with eight fingers. Oh, okay. Yeah. The same thing, I can keyboard with eight fingers. So um, first bo broken bone bones of my life. So uh, knock on wood. Knock on wood. Don't want to do it again. No, no. Mm. Well, this is a good day for Georgia. Yes. Yes. <laughs> The I was up until midnight. <laughs> I was not going to bed until I knew for sure. I was expecting the um, the margin to be bigger than it was. It was a little too close for my comfort. Well, once Kemp got involved and Me gave too. you know and gave Walker his whole campaign apparatus, that was my big fear. Because uh, there were a lot of people, and there are a lot of people that support Kemp and will do what he says and hold their nose and vote. Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it'll it'll be interesting now, especially on you know with the 51, 51 members. I didn't realize how much that was going to affect the committees. Right. That they that's now have the majority of all. Right. Members. Okay, Danny, here you go. Okay. Yeah. So. Well, while we're waiting for our speaker to, to join us this morning, um, it's kind of a good segue into a couple GAE retired announcements I want to share. Um, for those of you who are here thus far, <laughs> thank you for for joining us. We do the GAE Retired Lunch Bunch the first Wednesday of each month, starting at 1130 and going for an hour. And next Wednesday, if you are available, we are going to do another virtual event. This is through our rapid response team. And um, we're going to be talking, amongst other things, about the 2023 General Assembly. So the link to this information, I'll put it in the chat in a minute. It's in all the GAE and GAE retired communications vehicles. Um, and I'll put it on our GAE retired website. And next month, you can see a, a theme happening here. Mm -hmm. Our chief lobbyist, our GAE government relations director, Joe Fleming, will be doing um, the whole hour on an update on the 2023 General Assembly, because as Debbie Simons is saying, um, this is not going to be the same General Assembly we had last year. Mm -hmm. There are different people going to be in charge of things. And unfortunately, I've heard rumblings already, and Debbie, you may confirm or deny this, but um, because it's the first year of the two-year biennium, TRS um, yeah. looking at it, um, thank you for that nod yeah. or not, but TRS may be on the morphing yeah. block with all of this. And so that means we'll continue to be hypervigilant. And for those of you who are, whose anxiety, anxiety I just raised, it probably will not affect us directly if they make any changes or try and make any changes. They always couch it in, oh, it'll only affect the new hires. But we know through the trickle down effect that it ultimately will affect us. So I hope you'll attend both of those events. And um, yes, that's, I think, all I have to, to say about that. Karen, if I could just add to what you Please. just said, um, we've got new people in, you know, we've got a new speaker. We also have a new um, uh, appropriations chair. Uh, for those of you that have been around a long time, everybody's been around. We all know 
that Hill had been a great friend to our pension fund. Tillery, um, not so much. He's, he's talked not only at the General Assembly, but he's also talked to his local people. And I know that because Buster has been down in that area and the members there have spoken to him about their concerns. Uh, Tillery keeps talking about changing the entry persons into going into a defined contribution plan away from the defined benefit. Uh, the immediate one second effect of that is a cost savings to the state, but it does not bode well for the fund physically over a period of time. So Karen, when you say it doesn't affect us, it will affect us. So this is something that we have to be prepared for. And again, I, I point out that economic brochure or the economic impact brochure that uh, will break it. And that's on the TRS website that does break down by county how much money goes to each county from the pension fund to support our retirees. And I think a lot of our rural legislators are not immediately aware of the economic impact, the positive economic impact. That brochure not only shows how many millions of dollars goes into their coffers at their, their local level. And of course that means rent, mortgage, pay your bills, go to the grocery store, you know, repairs on your house, whatever. All that money goes back into local businesses there in their county, but it also gives the number of retirees and the number of active members, which means who votes. So if you begin to hear conversations about changing from a DB to a DC plan, even for, and like Karen says, that would be against the law to do it for those, those of us that are either retired or already active, it's extremely important that they understand how they're gonna undermine their own local systems. And again, that's the economic impact brochure. It's on the TRS website. You can download it, do whatever you want, you know, to get it. But I, there, there are discussions how how much traction it's going to get may depend upon how effectively we are able to track it. And if, if you all hear any of your local legislators beginning to ask questions, you know, bring it up, please, please, you know, notify Joe, notify Lisa, you know, email me, call Buster. Just use use your resources, people, because the quicker we can get on this, the better off we're all going to be. Thank you, Debbie, for um, just being the messenger at this point in time and for serving as chair of DRS. Um, I feel like we are always the faces on the front line, but sometimes I feel like we get information in an even more timely manner. Mm -hmm just because of, of your role with TRS, so. Always here to serve. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, for those of you who just joined us, thank you for, for being here. Um, we are waiting for our speaker and I don't think our speaker has joined us quite yet, but I feel certain Sandra is reaching out even as I speak. Um, so Tony, do you have yes, any? Yes, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Great. And Tony, do you have, as president of our GAE retired organization, anything you would like to share? I'd like to bring you up to date on uh, how GAE retired has been honored and selected by NEA and NEA retired. You may not be aware that GAE retired received a $5,000 grant for a program called CORAL from NEA organizing 
CORAL is an acronym that stands for Coalition of Active and Retired Act, uh, Leaders. And uh, this is to um, make sure that uh, GAE puts into practice having a coalition of um, members from retired, higher ed, aspiring ed, early career educators and active uh, at every um, event that is designed to recruit new members, our task uh, under the auspices of this grant is to help recruit in all membership categories, including retired. Uh, we have a big hurdle ahead of us with higher education. Uh, and right now I'm working with the, um, uh, with NEA uh, higher ed, uh, to uh, develop talking points of what benefits higher ed employees uh, by being a member of NEA GAE. The other uh, grant we received was um, the vision of our legislative chair, Linda Wolf-Smith, is called The Wind Beneath Our Wings. And it aligns GE retired with aspiring educators and early career educators. And our task is going to be to support those uh, membership categories. Uh, it, it solidifies the kind of mentoring that we want to uh, provide. And it's an exciting, exciting um, opportunity for all of you to get involved. So I hope that before you leave here today, you'll give us your contact information through direct chat so that we can get you engaged with this exciting opportunity. Uh, I know that we all have a passion for supporting aspiring and early career educators. And so this is your opportunity to get involved. So please give us your contact information in a direct chat so that we can reach out to you and get you involved in this important opportunity. Um, our, our speaker's not here yet. The other thing I want you to know is that Linda's other vision, um, hashtag uh, call to action was highly successful. And I think I thank those of you who were involved in that action. Uh, GAE retired and the uh, uh, Georgia Coalition Caucus uh, together, our non-affiliate partner and ODE retired. And um, was it Richmond County, Augusta? Augusta, uh, we were able to reach uh, voters in retirement communities to make sure that they had access to their uh, voting rights and could access their ballot and vote in the general election and the runoff. And of course, we know after last night uh, GAE's uh, recommended candidate, Senator Raphael Warnock, was successful in his re-election bid. So those are just some of the highlights of what GAE uh, retired has accomplished. Uh, you may be aware also that we received the Spirit of Membership Award from NEA Retired. It's the first time this award was given and it was given because of that action, hashtag GAE, uh, hashtag call to action. So um, you can be proud that you're a member of GAE Retired and we hope you'll become more involved in our initiatives. I see a lot of names here that uh, haven't, worked with us yet on some of our initiatives. So put in the chat to me or to Karen or to Sandra, your contact information, if you're willing to work where you are, not drive to Tucker, but work where you are to help us with these important initiatives. Thank you, Tony. Great information all around.
Sandra, would you like to introduce our speaker for today? Is here today with us. Today we have Dr. Fayron Epps. She's been a nurse for over 20 years of experience, and she serves as the assistant professor at the um, Emory University and director of community and research engagement in the Office <laughs> of Diversity. And she talks a lot, or she's going to talk to us today about brain health. So without further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Fayron Epps. Hi, everyone. Good. It's still morning. Good morning. I am sorry for my tardiness. It's just back to back meetings, but I'm glad to be here. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Um, I see some familiar names. I think I spoke maybe a couple of months ago. I had came in and we we talked about dementia and we digged into it and talked about the role of the faith community. Um, I didn't really want to repeat that, but I'm open to answering any questions that's related to that, especially if you all have questions related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, but I had told um, Ms. Sandra that I want to speak a lot about, <laughs> about brain health, um, how we can reduce those risks and just have some conversation um, around that. And so if it's okay, I can share my screen right quick. Um, let me just go to the slide that I need. I did give you screen sharing rights. Thank you. And it's just one slide that we're gonna talk through. And Ms. Sandra, hi, how many minutes? I don't need that long. Well, you have about, what, what do we have about 20, 25 minutes? Um, till about 1226. Yes. All right. So, well, I, don't, I might not need that much, but we can have <laughs> a conversation, you know, I'm sure y'all might have other things to talk about, but I just want to make sure that we are aware of the six pillars of brain health. So ARP um, had, they created a global council on brain health because dementia is really attacking all of our families and our communities. So I particularly work with communities of color and so we're disproportionately impacted by uh, dementia and, um, and also including Alzheimer's disease, but vascular dementia, Parkinson's dementia, Lewy body, frontal temporal lobal dementia. So these are the things that are really attacking us. And you know, how can we reverse the statistics? And one of the statistics that I share a lot is by 2030, 40% of individuals that would be diagnosed with a form of dementia will be black or Latino. That's less than eight years away and close to half of the individuals. And so this is why now when I go out in the community, I wanna talk about, well, what can we do to, to promote brain health and reverse those statistics? And one of the things is being social. So coming to this meeting, <laughs> um, so it's not always about being social in person, it's also finding ways to be social online as well. You wanna keep in touch with your friends, you don't want to be isolated. So um, these past two and a half or almost three years during the pandemic, isolation brought on so much, that loneliness, that depression, and we've seen a direct link to cognitive impairment as well. Um, and so it also exacerbar exacerbated many uh, of the symptoms that were associated with dementia. So being social is really, really key. And y'all feel free to let me know if you have any questions or put anything in the chat and we can talk about. Um, I, I do a lot with faith communities. So I tell people, if your church is back open, going back to church, I know you're there to get spiritually fed, but also being able to engage with others is so, so important. The next thing is engaging your brain. So we want to find ways that we can stimulate our brain. So what are some new hobbies? What are um, new interests? Do we want to learn a new language? I'm, I'm going to take that out. We may not want to, but we need to find something to cha challenge our brain, right? And so it is learning a new language, how to play a new instrument. 
If you're doing puzzles, y'all know a while back, everyone says, yes, do puzzles, crossword puzzles, and that's fine, but I want to make sure it is challenging because, you know, there's levels to a lot of these puzzles. We have easy, moderate, <laughs> and hard, and a lot of us may pick the easy one, and that's not doing anything for us. We want something that's going to challenge us. So if you can go to the medium or the hard level, that would be really, really good. I tell family members, if you're giving um, a friend or a, a loved one a puzzle to do and they finish it quickly, that's good. But it means that you need to think about what else can I introduce to them so it can be a little bit more challenging. Not too challenging where it's frustrating, but challenging where it's going to take you a minute to pause and think about it. Any questions with this? All right. I see all these initials and names. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to picture you all are just nodding your head. All right. And so uh, the next one is managing your stress. I tell a lot of people, um, especially, you know, I'm in a church setting. We're too blessed to be stressed. There's so much literature now that's coming out that's saying stress is related to cognitive decline. And um, and not just stress overall, I want to speak, speak for those that um, are Black, African-American, or of a minority racial or ethnic group that's on the call, even racial discrimination is a form of stress. Just the things that we may go through and we internalize. Um, there's a recent literature that came out this fall, how racial discrimination leads to cognitive decline and Black individuals. And so all of that really just all ties back to the stress that this has caused. And a lot of us may not say that we're, we, we, oh, we're not stressed and we don't want to complain and stuff like that. But I want to tell you all, your body, it's internalized, you're internalizing the stress, but your body, if we was to hook you up to blood pressure, put a patch on you, check your heart rate, your body can show us that you're stressed. And sometimes you can feel your heart rate go up. And those are things that we, um, perspiring uh, also is a, is, is a physical sign that someone may be in a stressful situation, a different breathing pattern. So we just need to find our way how we can manage the stress. So I know I will never be able to get rid of all the stress that's in my life. You know, I got kids. <laughs> I, I've been told that I would be stressed all the way. That it just as soon as I had my, my son and now I have three. Um, and, uh, but, you know, what can I do to incorporate relaxation? To add some stability to, to my schedule? I know many of you all, if not all, are retired. Um, and my mom's retired. And so it would be great for me to be like, oh, yes, y'all are hardly stressed. But I know my mom is stressed every day um, because she's worrying about her kids. So there is something that, you know, you do is constantly on your mind and may cause some stress. And so um, please find ways to manage that meditation, whatever it is, we can manage our stress in different ways. I go walking without the cell phone. <laughs> um, and so just think think of ways that you can do that ongoing exercise is another thing and I think this has been preached a lot um, talked about a lot how we need to do exercise and if here you can see the target is two and a half hours a week of moderate physical activity and if you're under a care of a provider you just want to get that clearance um, but what is moderate physical activity? What do y'all, can y'all define that for me? Can y'all give me some examples of what you think that is? Walking. So if it's walking, um, I think that was Miss Karen that said walking. Um, if it's walking, is it walking? At a brisk pace with two dogs. There you go. That's the, that's pulling you two different directions, right? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so, yes, walking would be good at a brisk uh, pace. And one of the things we want to make sure our heart rate 
is up. So some type of exercise that um, increases our heart rate. And if you're a person that perspires or sweat, that's a sign that your heart rate is up. And so we look like if you're sweating during this exercise and your heart rate is up, that's what we're, th we're talking about, that type mm -hmm. of exercise. Fayron, did they talk about how many minutes an hour is a brisk walk? What no? So on the average, when we tell people, we say you want to exercise for at least thirty minutes, because yeah. it it takes a few minutes just to get your heart rate up and, well, and just, start sweating. I just, I just wondered if it was like they were saying like two thousand steps in twenty minutes. Oh no, I don't have no details um, okay. specific to specific to that, Miss Debbie. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, you know, again, I just say the heart rate and sweat because people do exercise different ways. Yeah. And those are the things, whatever you do, if it can, you know, if it's going up and down the stairs, <laughs> uh, and your heart rate and you, and you start sweating, you can count that as, as exercise. Those are the things we just need that heart rate up. I'm gonna be honest. We need something to get your heart rate up. Um, the next thing is sleep. How many people get eight hours of sleep on this call? All of y'all should get eight hours of sleep. That's right, Miss Karen. You get eight hours. Uh, it is recommended that you um, brain help for us to get restorative sleep. And that is seven to eight hours of restful, restful sleep every day. And these are seven to eight hours that is consistent. It's not broken up. It's not taking a two hour nap and then piecing it, piecing it together. This is consistent and you're doing it on a routinely basis. And um, I tell people, you know, if you're only getting five hours of sleep now, just set goals to see if you can increase it. Let me try to get five and a half, then get six and work your way up to that. I will tell you all that this is so, so important so important and you know uh, our society and I know even in my family we were like you work hard 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 don't need that much sleep you got to get it function over off of four hours of sleep I think um when President Obama was in office I think that was said and so a lot of people do not really focus on sleep and they don't understand the importance and the tie it has to Alzheimer's disease but when we sleep, we're actually flushing out the plaques and tangles that cause Alzheimer's disease. So your spinal fluid is coming up and it's flushing out all those plaques, all of those tangles that's up here. And it needs seven to eight hours to, to do that. And if you all think um, when you were out there working and stuff like that, um, or just you may do that now where you don't get all your sleep or you try to you sit up 24 to 48 hours sometime with little sleep. There's this thing people call brain fog, where sometimes you can't think as clearly and all that stuff. Imagine you doing that over a period of 20 and 30 years. What's that doing to your brain? And so just really think about that. And so if you're not getting sleep now, I encourage you all to let's think of ways that we can incorporate taking out the cell phones, no computers and um, in our bedroom, no TV, if that works for you. Uh, TV makes me fall asleep, so I do need it on. So it's just finding these things. Some people have told me they set a timer on their phone when they need to start winding down. So whatever works for you, I just will encourage us all to find ways to get more sleep. And then the next thing is eating right. And I don't, I don't promote any special diet. I believe the American Heart Association, they did such a great job in the late 90s, early 2000s with the heart healthy diet. Um, and the heart healthy diet is what you should be following. And I tell everybody, we know by now, we know what we should be eating. The problem is, is if we want to eat it and if we have access to it, to me, those are the issues. But we pretty much know what are those foods we should be eating. And I want to tell you, whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. So that low sodium, um, 
all these different diets that we have learned that is good for us, we really need to look at that. Um, I'm not telling us to cut out all the sugars and all the fried foods because I'm not going to do that, but it's about modification. And we really, really, really need to look into that. And a lot of these brain health activities as it relates to exercising and eating and stress, y'all, is really tied to those, the heart conditions, cardiovascular diseases. And if we don't manage our cardiovascular diseases, such as diabetes, hypertension, um, having strokes, even kidney problems are connected to your cardiovascular system. If we do not manage that, it puts us at risk for a type of dementia called vascular dementia. So I wanna make sure I'm trying my best to keep this tie, tying it back so you can see how important this is. And if you all are diagnosed with any of these chronic illnesses that I just shared, I ask that you please do, if you're on medications, take the medications, consider what kind of lifestyle changes and it falls right here in the brain health that you can make so possibly you can get off the medications or if they're said that we need to lose weight, that you can, you can try to do that because it is directly related to our cognitive health. It really is. And a lot of people do not see that connection between the heart and brain, but it is, it is there. And as you may be concerned with your, your swelling in your feet and darkness around your ankles, or you're concerned over a family member of that, I want you to think about what's happening in the brain when you see dark ankles, dark feet, or you see the swelling. That same thing that we may see in our extremities is also happening in the brain and we just cannot see it. And symptoms, changes in our brain can occur eight to 20 years before people start exhibiting the signs for people to be concerned and to get follow-up and testing. So it's so important, um, you know, if you all have any family members, um, any kids and grandkids, for you to share this brain health information as well. And I'm going to put a link um, in the chat where you can get more of this information. But um, it's to share because we, we can start, it is never too early to start engaging in brain health activities, doing things with your family that's around this. And I try to do this and it makes me feel good because they don't know what I'm doing, but I know I'm trying to promote brain health and I'm trying to, you know, make things better as we, as we age and, and, and we're older. I want to, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just let you all know that um, if you do have any concerns about your own memory or family member's memory, and you don't feel like going to your provider right now, and you just want to check some things out, you can actually screen your memory online for free. And it's through a, a group called Us Against Alzheimer's, and it's mybrainguide.org. I will put that in the chat. You can go in your room in a closet and just ask, answer these questions. And in the state of Georgia, I work with them where if you have an abnormal screening, it pulls up a different additional tab that can share with you resources and where you can go within your area to get further help. So I will share that, but this link that I give you, you can share with anybody, even outside of Georgia. And if there is a concern, they can print the paper and they can bring it to their provider. They can take it every day if they like, um, take it once a month. But you all may know that if you're 65 and older, when you go to your provider, you should be getting your memory screened anyway. It should be automatic. And if they're not doing it and you don't need, they may be, and you just unsure, just ask them. Because many providers, they do it, I say, on the slick. They don't say, oh, I'm about to do your memory screening. They just kind of embed it in their questions. Um, but, you know, it's always good to ask, have you been checking my memory? So you can know the baseline. And if you have an abnormal memory screening, it does not mean you have dementia. It means you just need additional follow-up. There's many other illnesses that mimic the signs and symptoms of dementia, like urinary tract infection, dehydration, vitamin B12 deficiency, 
Um, those, those are just a few, but there's many things that mimic if it goes untreated. So, um, you know, again, I'm never here. I never come to audiences to bring fear. My thing is just to make sure we're educated and we can be empowered to help out ourselves, help out our family and our community. And that's it. I'm going to put these links in the chat and I'm, I'm here to answer any questions. Well, I want to thank you for all the information. And one thing connected, I guess, I've already forgotten the pillars on the chart, but um, with brain health that I'm, I'm um, encouraging my 92 and a half year old mother to deal with is she has hearing aids and um, she, you know, where I'm going with this is when she's in her apartment by herself, she doesn't need to wear them because um, she can hear everything when she's by herself and I'm thinking, oh, you know, the sensory input in whatever variety, she doesn't need to to cut herself off from that. And um, am I right? Yeah, it yeah, it it will help because it's it's stimulating her brain. Great. I want to share something that we put, we have been putting in our in the loop newsletter that Karen Solheim uh, does. And that is um, state health benefit plans offers a program that is designed for weight loss, but it really is more of a healthy eating program. Kimberly Evans told me about it. And uh, Kim, can I put you on the spot since I'm in bad voice today and ask you to tell people a little bit about that program? Um. It's a program that goes right along with some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, even though you're going to be doing healthy eating is where they try to lead you to. They also talk about exercise. They talk about emotional health. They talk about stress. And then they give you ideas of how to alleviate these things, which is, you know, and, and incorporating everything. And, and when Debbie was asking about how many steps to to make during your 30 minutes, they teach you about the levels of breathing so that you'll know that if you can talk on the phone to somebody while you're walking, maybe you're not working out hard enough. You need to kind of up the pace. And if you are kind of breathy, then that means that you're getting that heart rate up and you're doing some things good. But anyway, it's a program that looks at your, at your physical, your mental, and your emotional health. And with the United with our with United Healthcare, they will provide you with some additional instruments, like you get a, a weight scale for your body, you get a scale for weighing your food, you get a plate <clears throat> so that you can see your portions. They send you a blender so that you can make your smoothies. They send you um, exercise bands and they send you exercise tapes. Everything is geared towards us. If we don't have, if we can't do some of the things that they want us to do standing, you have the sitting aspect of it, to sit in your chair and do the, the chair exercises. They send you, you have a coach that you talk to once a week, you're online, and then you can have a direct relationship with this coach where you can you know, call in and talk to her, but it's a group and they encourage you. They motivate you and, and everything is just, there's no, no shame or guilt in it. We talk about sleep. We talk about um, brain health. We talk about all the things that Farron has talked to us about today. And then you have this person that you, uh, that you can actually talk to with at United Healthcare. And then you have this group that, you know, you, got, you can kind of bond with them if you so desire. But it has, I have enjoyed it. I have um, ventured out, done different things, not just the walking. I, I've gotten into yoga. I, you know, I've done line dancing. I do um, indoor walking, outdoor walking. Now Tara has got me into maybe trying some swimming, but just doing different things. Like she was saying to, to kind of teach us and to our bodies to conform. And I think, I, I think I'm doing pretty good and I've seen some other results with some other people who have been involved and it, it it's it's kind of joyful it's 
It's something that I enjoy and I think that most of us would. And with the eating and the water, I know you didn't mention water, but that's oh. one of the things <laughs> that we need to really, really incorporate is more water. She talked about hydrating and flushing out the brain. You know, it's like we don't want to rinse our hair with a Coca-Cola. We want water if we're going to wash or rinse our hair. So we need to put more water in our body so that when we do that flush she's talking about, we can get a good rinse maybe with, with what's going there to help get rid of some of those things. But drinking water. And it, it's a wonderful program. And if anybody would like some additional information or some help getting started with it or just signing up, because once you sign up, they take very good care of you. And I, and you can just try it. You don't have to stay, you know, two weeks, you know, not at all or whatever. But I think we all should give it a try. And Kimberly, it's for, yes, it's free and it is your state health benefits plan benefit. It's called Rally Coach. And uh, the information to sign up is in the loop. Okay. Does that answer everybody's questions from the chat? about what Kimberly was sharing. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I have a question just about the standard Medicare memory test. What's up with this analog clock at 8.15 that you're supposed to draw when, you know, I'm not sure I have an analog clock in my house at this point in time. Yeah, a lot of people uh, bring that up. and But the thing is, what they're looking for is, um, it's so much to that. They're, they're looking at where those numbers, like how someone is processing that. And even though, you know, people say, oh, I haven't looked at a hand clock. Um, you, should, you should be able, Ms. Karen, <laughs> To remember what where the numbers go on the clock. Um, do people do get confused with the 15 minutes past 11 or you know, whatever people say? Um, but even my daughter, she is in third, fourth grade now, and they they have learned about hand clocks. So they learn about the digital clocks as well, but they have learned about the, the, the hand. I think I'm calling it the hand clocks. I think I'm calling it right. <laughs> uh, and so, long. And yeah. Long. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. So, um, but the thing is, I tell people that that's not about your memory. It's really about how you're processing. So Alzheimer's disease or dementia is more than just your a memory disorder or impaired memory. It's impaired reasoning, and it's also um, it, it impairs your emotion emotions. Um, so that's your again how you're processing things, and that's what that clock is really all about. How someone is taking the instructions and processing it. I have a question. What is the percentage or the likelihood in getting dementia if it's like part of the DNA? Because my mother will always say, my mother had it, I'm going to have it, and you're going to have it. Although they try to say we can change those receptacles or whatever, receptives or whatever. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. But how true is that with the DNA? Yeah, I actually just learned this fall that if it runs in your family, you have a 40% likelihood of experiencing signs and symptoms of dementia. But we also say if these are the things that, um, if we can engage in these brain health activities, hopefully you can reduce that likelihood. But um, it is, it's, I'm gonna be honest, Ms. Valerie, it is not sad. I've met so many families, only the women in the family get it. Yeah, okay. Only, only all, all, um, all the uh, aunts or skips a generation. It is so hard. Um, to really be able to say for sure you're going to get it. Now there are, um, don't ask me which, what the genes are, but there are two genes and they're calling them more definitive genes, but only three, it only is able to really identify 3% of the population. Okay. That okay. will have uh, Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hog the questions, but I'm going to ask, is it possible 
I guess through following the the pillars to stave off dementia and or um, even reverse dementia or so slow it down. So there's no thing right now, y'all, I'm going to be honest, there's nothing that slows it down. So these uh, conditions can reduce your risk, but it cannot prevent it. It cannot cure it. It can't flip the script, however you want to say it. But, um, but it can help maintain some of the things, the behaviors, I think more research is going to be being done to follow individuals that are living with dementia that engage in some of these activities. So hopefully we can see, but for us to really show that, that's like long-term really research that needs to occur over years because they need to follow individuals. Um, and since we're talking about research, I have to put that plug in here for you all to always consider opportunities to participate and different clinical trials, and all of them are not medication related. Some of them are just observing your behaviors over years. Some of them is taking education courses. So I just, I have to put that plug in there to always consider how you can contribute to um, research and then contribute to how things can change for your, your children and your grandchildren. Um, because your participation in research that's what it would be making the mark for, is to change things for future generations. Um, something else you asked, um, Ms. Karen. Oh, let me see. I wanted to say, do, 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 do. can't reverse the risk. Yeah. Oh, the medicine, the new medicines that are out. Um, so the medications that have been out for a while, a lot of doctors say, oh, that slows the disease down. And again, it only manages those symptoms um, that's associated with the disease. But whatever patho that is occurring in your brain, pathophysiology related to that disease is still occurring. So, but the, they have some new medications that are coming out. Um, and y'all probably seen them in the literature. Please don't ask me to pronounce them because they're like three, four symptoms. <laughs> they're very hard. But um, they're for individuals with mild cognitive impairment or maybe in the early stages. And they're saying that now those medications may have a likelihood to slow or reverse some things. And it's still early on, but they have promising results that they just published on November the 29th about some of the drugs. So I just tell people to stay tuned. We, I, I think it's coming that we're gonna have um, some drugs that then Ms. Karen, I can say that this reverses, but I'm gonna let you know it takes a whole process because the drug is gonna come out, it's gonna be super expensive. Then the insurance companies are gonna be bad. Oh, it's gonna be a whole process. But um, people like me, we're out here advocating. So as these things come out, that they can be accessible to all and not just the riches of the rich. So Ms. Epps, you're talking about a medication that's uh, going to be prescription medication, not this over-the-counter stuff that we've oh, been- Oh, I do not promote any over-the-counter. <laughs> yes, it has to be FDA um, really, for real. I say, like my kids say, for real, for real. FDA approved because they have some people they they were just like yeah we're FDA approved but they're really not um and so yes I'm talking about medications that come with a prescription okay thank you again mm -hmm. and so since we're bringing this up y'all watch out for the scams um mm -hmm. please watch out for the scams this is one of the um I have to say, I don't know what's the right term, but um, when someone is experiencing signs and symptoms of dementia, and they've had it in their family and they've watched another family member, they will go um, through all costs to try to get help. And if that means paying $600 for 30 pills and things like that, they, they have people that's out there targeting us based on, you know, that we, we want that hope and we have to really be mindful of that and do our research beforehand and, and have it checked out by a provider to make sure before we, 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 um, we spend that money.
And if someone were interested in um, being part of a research study, would there be um, how how what would you suggest if somebody were interested? Yeah, I will put a link in the chat. Um, so the Emory Alzheimer's Disease Center, they have a registry, clinical trials have a registry. And um, and sometimes people call you <laughs> um, or you may see people or you may see me out recruiting for research. My thing is when you see something that may interest you, please read about it. Please ask questions. Um, there's a lot of things that have been put in place um, to make sure things are uh, following um, that are ethically right um, and following those processes. But I always tell people, please go off of your gut feeling when you're talking to the individuals and stuff, because even though the research study may be good, I really, you want to make sure that that individual um, can answer your questions because concerns can, can come up. And you want to know where they're sharing your information and if they are and who they're going to share it with. So these are just questions to, to ask so you can be informed. And also, would you get results? Some studies will allow you to get the results and some not. And so just really ask the questions. I wanted to know about, um, you were saying do not take over the counter like the Prevagen or Nareva. Um, can you tell me, you know, because I have friends that take Prevagen, and I was just wondering how, why you say not to take those over the counter? Because none, I, I doubt you, uh, you'll find a healthcare provider, unless they're getting paid by that company, that will approve, approve that or say, yes, take it. Mm -hmm. It has not gone through all the testing, all the research that it needs to say that it really does this, that does what it claims. It does not have the research to back it. It has not been through the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the recommendation would be just to do these brain healthy things to help your brain. All the things that you talked about. Yeah, and there may be some other holistic things that you can do mm -hmm. that does not does not cost all of that. You know, yeah, when it's, when it's a lot of money associated, it's something that you just need to take a pause at. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this is Judy Polachek. Um, my husband died uh, over three years ago, but the last couple of years that he was alive, he was in an Emory study. And um, I would highly recommend their studies. Um, they kept up with him, they um, gave him different important tests um so i i was very very pleased with the study that he was in thank you for sharing that miss judy and i put the links here it's an interest form and it's also a link so you can see their current studies this is also a way that you can get access to a lot of tests and resources that it's not available just for the, the lay community or the public or um, resources that the managed care companies, insurance companies can will not pay for. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Epps? Thank you so much, Dr. Epps. As always, you have educated and empowered us, and I appreciate you, and I thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you so much, and thank you all for your attentiveness. Thank you for your questions. Um, I have to put the plug in here. <laughs> if you all are part of a Black faith community and may want to work with me or partner with me, I would love to hear from you. Um, if any of you all are on a caregiving journey, I would also love, we have education, um, online education resources that we provide, and, and we have online education studies. Let me just say that, <laughs> which is uh, it's a research study, but people don't even realize they're in a research study, so, because they're not getting a medication, so that's, again, it just reinforces there's different types of studies. So I will put my contact information in the chat. Right. And, um, and y'all feel free to reach out 
to me. And Miss Sandra, anytime you need me, just give me a call or holler. I will do that. I will show up. I may be late, but I'll show up. <laughs> we we'll appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, late than right. never. Thank you. Thank you. And y'all happy okay. holidays. Be safe and take care. Okay. You too now. Thanks again. And before we um, exit for today, I just want to hold up just some announcements um, that uh, came out in the, the loop this week, our GAE Retired Newsletter. And if you're not getting in the loop, I'll put my name and, and number email in the chat. Please let me know. But you have to actually read it to know what's going on. So Next Monday, there's a, a hearing from NEA um, for the upcoming NEA budget for us as retired members to give input. I mentioned next Wednesday, we're going to be doing this via Zoom um, and talking about the 2023 General Assembly. And um, thereafter, on Saturday, December 7th, there will be a hearing on the public school employee retirement system. And Sandra, this is down in your area in Columbus, Georgia. And um, if you would like to, if you are a PSERS member, um, please submit your comments. Apparently from what GAE President Lisa Morgan was sharing yesterday, PSERS members at maximum retirement only take home $480 a month. These are our wow. custodians and our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers. And so it, it's highway robbery. And then if they're in a, a government pension offset windfall elimination provision system, their social security will be docked. So, um, Yes, this is during the holidays, but if you um, are available to go and give input and to share your story, if you're impacted, please do so. January, we'll have our Lobby and Learn Conference. Again, it'll be virtual. Um, it's just easier to get people together on a Saturday morning. And this is designed to get us really, really ready for the General Assembly that will start the following Monday on January 9th. Um, we will have our next GAE Retired Business Meeting on January 20th. It will be by Zoom, another one in March, and our all-member conference in April. And I need to change this because, Sandra, again, we're coming to Columbus for this. So this is, is spending some time in the Columbus area. Um, we do monitor the TRS meetings and um, you're, there's a link here to click on what went on with TRS at their last meeting and their next meeting in January. Um, the leadership summit for NEA is in March. If you would like to contact your GAE retired at-large board members, which Tony Smith, myself, and Brenda Montgomery, who's on this Zoom, with anything you'd like to have um, discussed by the GAE board of directors, please reach out. And please attend your district meetings. Yes, we're all part of the retired organization, but we also can attend any of the district meetings. And if you don't know what district you're in, you can click here and find that out. We will have our GAE Retired Day at the Capitol in February. And then GAE Day at the Capitol will be later on that month. So the idea is we will know what's going on earlier in February, and then we can help out at the GAE Day at the Capitol later on. Um, Tony spoke about the state organizing grant that we've um, received, and I'm gonna skip to a couple other things here and then we'll wind up since it's 1230. By February 1st, if you want to be a delegate to the GAE Spring Representative Assembly that I just spoke about, then you'll wanna go through and complete this form 
And we, are, we GAE Retired, is part of a pilot to do online nominations for this election. So check that out. And the last thing, if you're interested to being one of the three GAE retired delegates to the NEA Representative Assembly in July in Orlando, please fill this form out by February 1st. Again, I'll put my contact info in the chat, reach out if you have any questions or concerns. And we do pride ourselves on these meetings of having a hard stop and a hard start, not necessarily in that order. So I thank you all for being here today. And I hope you will join us next month when we'll go through and speak with our GAE lobbyist, Joe Fleming, about what might or might not be happening during our next General Assembly. So thank you for being a GAE RIP member, a GAE retired member. And um, happy holidays to everyone. Have Thank a good day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Hey, Sandra. Hey, Linda, <laughs> I didn't know you were on. I'm at Bye. a school, I'm at a school meeting. I'm at, oh, a school, okay. I'm at a school meeting with the membership. Oh. Oh, okay. At good old Washington High School. So oh. I look, since that line, since that last pie burned up and forgot it was in the stove, I would definitely be using this resource. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one, guys. Okay, baby. Good to hear. Okay, good to then. see your face. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.